Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we just want to say welcome to our COVID town hall. And um, also, just to give you a heads up, this meeting is live and is being recorded. Um, and so to get started, we would we want to be able to to have uh, Bishop Kelvin Simmons open us up with a word of prayer. Good evening, good evening, wonderful people. Thank you for joining us at this town hall meeting. Once again, uh, congregations organized for prophetic engagement COPE along with IEC, AAC, which is uh, the Inland Empire Concerned African-American Churches, ICAC, with our outstanding partners at Loma Linda University Health, uh, we are excited once again to continue our march in, sa in saving lives and protecting everyone against the COVID-19 virus. Our steps have been educating, testing, vaccinating, and distributing uh, kits to the people that we serve. Tonight, we are in the educational phase, again, bringing faith and science together. I am Bishop Kelvin Simmons, co-pastor at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship in Rancho Cucamonga, California, also president of the Inland Empire Concerned African American Churches. Right before I open us with a word of prayer, I'd like to share these words from you from Proverbs 4, 6, and 7. It says, do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. And that's why we are here this evening so that we can get wisdom and be better for our communities. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for an opportunity to share with your people information that will be beneficial for them, their children, and those around them. We thank you, God, for our partners at Loma Linda. We thank you, God, for COPE and IEC, AAC, and everyone that's with us tonight. Now, Father, we ask that we receive all that you have for us. Bless us now as we move forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. We thank you all once again for joining us. I have already uh, briefly introduced our panelists for this evening, uh, but I will circle back and uh, introduce uh, the lead organizer of COPE Congregation Organized for Prophetic Engagement, Pastor Sam Casey. Good evening, Pastor Casey. Hey, Bishop, good evening. Uh, good evening to everyone who's tuned in. We're super excited as always to bring, um, as our fearless leader, Bishop Kelvin Simmons has laid out before us, um, just, just wisdom and information to our community. We want to continue to remain safe. And although uh, things are rapidly changing and information is rapidly changing around COVID, uh, we still want to be able to provide our uh, constituents and those whom God has entrusted to our care um, with the latest updates. Uh, we're so grateful for the leadership of Lania King. Um, we don't know what to call her anymore. She used to be the administrative assistant uh, we're praying about some different things for her life. Uh, we're just excited to be here again tonight, Bishop. And thank you so much for your leadership um, uh, on this project. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much, Pastor Casey. And, and of course, thank you to Sister Lania King. Um, where I'm from, we just call her boss. So <laughs> anyhow, we, we thank you for your service tonight. Again, I want to introduce to you from Loma Linda University, Dr. Jacinda Abdul Mutakabir, Dr. Jam, and Dr. Petit, who will be our panelists for tonight. And so I wanna welcome to the microphone, our first presenter, uh, Dr. Bridget Petit. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Simmons. It's good to be back with you all this evening. Uh, I'm sort of the opening act for Dr. Jam. Um, I'm Dr. Bridget Petit, affectionately known by this group as Dr. Bridge. 
I am uh, an associate, not, ooh, I said, I'm said associate, I'm a full professor of psychology now um, at Loma Linda University. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, I teach in the area of health disparities and health inequities, uh, as well as substance abuse. I am a clinical supervisor at the SAC Health Clinic. Uh, and I am uh, in service to the community to address these issues in my research um, and in my service contributions. So I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. I have just a few slides um, to present to you, kind of talking about the psychological aspects of decision making around the vaccine. Um, and just to kind of prime you for all the great and wonderful information that um, Dr. Jam has for you. Um, and following up. So let me see if I can get things going correctly. Okay, can you see the notes page or the full slides? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, I always like to start out with these um, just recognition. Um, I know many of you, including myself, have been hit hard by COVID in terms of personal illness, um, loss of loved ones. It's been a really tough, tough two years. Um, it's hard to believe that we're coming up on, on two years in this pandemic. I know uh, my own children were sent home, I think, uh, around mid-March uh, in, in 2020. So we've been dealing with this for a long haul. I know folks are tired. Um, but we have to keep these conversations going to make sure that we are prioritizing the health and well-being of Black and Brown individuals um, in our region. Uh, we know some of the data, which I'll just present briefly, um, just to kind of give you a sense of where we've been with this pandemic. Why are we doing this work, uh, this special work um, with you all tonight? So with our decision making, a lot of times people think that they're making well-informed, decisions, they think they're being, um, they're weighing all the information, they're being fully thoughtful about it. And what we know is that the red dot represents the information that you use to make decisions. So recent information, um, how often you hear information, the information that's presented that is extreme or really vivid. So we think about how the news presents information and information that is negative. But that only accounts for a fraction of all the information that is available to make informed decision. And my hope tonight is just that you will be thinking about what other information do I need to make informed decisions about my health and the health and well-being of my family. So COVID death rates, um, this is data from 2021, so a little bit um, outdated, but I think it's important to and I, I would imagine the numbers are still the same. This was data that we presented back in November that was talking about COVID as the number one cause of daily deaths in the US. Um, I know uh, Dr. Jacinda can talk about her experiences um, and, and really just seeing those numbers um, just outweigh those traditional things that we've been worrying about, heart disease, cancer, um, and really seeing that this is a, a huge problem, you know, where people say, oh, this is just a, a few people. Um, we're thinking about that daily death toll. If you think about it in the context of maybe your church congregation or your children's school or agencies that you work for, we're not talking about insignificant numbers. We're talking about thousands and thousands, and at this point, millions of people and their lives. We're talking about um, here tonight um, with the town hall targeting Black and African American uh, individuals in particular, because we saw that the uh, cases of infection were 1.1 times more likely to occur in Black and, Af and African Americans compared to whites, um, 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID and COVID complications, and then nearly twice as likely to die from COVID. And we know there are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, many pre-existing conditions that have already been affecting our communities were only exacerbated by the effects of COVID, but we really need to make sure that we understand that this is a even more predominant and more important issue in our communities, and we need to make sure we're protecting our health. This number compares the vaccinated and unvaccinated, and I know many people will argue um, it's not worth it. You know, people will say, oh, I got the, maybe I got the first dose, second dose, but I don't want to get boosters. I don't want to keep getting, um, getting shots. Um, really think about the difference in death rates for those people who've been vaccinated versus, versus those who have not. 
um, you can kind of see the um, case, daily cases per 100,000. Um, those who were unvaccinated were five times more likely to die as those who were fully vaccinated. And the average daily deaths for the unvaccinated was 13 times higher than those who were fully vaccinated. And so we're talking about first, second dose, and then moving into boosters, which we're, we'll talk a little bit more about. Now, I understand. I understand, you know, part of my work as a, as a educator in higher education is really talking about what are the things that prevent us from having optimal health. And we know, you know, there were a lot of political discord, a lot of political discord that was happening when the vaccine was developed. Uh, we have historical injustices that black and brown bodies have been um, afflicted by at the hands of the government, science, and healthcare. And even more recently, I know many people, when I ask people to, you know, raise their hand and, and you know, have you ever had an, a negative experience that you think was great based on race um, at your doctor's office? Many people will raise their hand and say, yes, I've had that experience. And so we get it. This is a real fear. These are real experiences um, that people have. We also, though, see a lot of times that misinformation. So remember I said that little red dot represent how much information there is out there about, the, um, about an issue. The same goes for the vaccine. You're constantly bombarded trying to keep up with the news. You know, what's the latest data? And a lot of people kind of get burnt out and stop keeping up with the latest guidelines and recommendations because there's just so much. But with that, it's also misinformation. So. Uh, people, you know, uh, may have uh, ideas about, you know, uh, the the imagined, um, you know, ingredients that go into these the vaccines um, may overemphasize the side effects in comparison to the benefits, et cetera. And we know all of that has happened um, with regard to uh, the COVID vaccine in particular. So what we hope is that by kind of um, looking at how we've really worked as a scientific community to really overcome the barriers to um, COVID spreading, um, there was a lot of money thrown at the development of these vaccines. And mostly the bureaucracy, so all that red tape that it takes to get vaccines to development, that's what was cut. So the science behind the vaccine um, remained solid. It was based on existing um, information that we already knew in the scientific community. Um, and, and really, you know, it's um, those, those like long-term uh, delays really come from the bureaucracy. And so that's why we were able to get a vaccine so quickly and one that's even more effective than, so, than other vaccines that we might um, typically get. So this was such a great, um, such great news, I think, in the scientific community to have something that was so effective um, get to the market soon to start saving lives. In terms of um, mistrust for science and healthcare, I know, you know, usually at this at these events, I'm collecting data and getting ready to publish data from, from some of these activities to talk about what are the factors that influence people's decisions to get the vaccine, along with Dr. Jam and members of ICAC and COPE as well. Um, I know for a fact that just to ask you if this, if you found this information helpful, yes or no, <laughs> it took me 29 pages of a, a document to get it approved through my university to just ask simple questions. There is so much protection in human subjects research where we can we can't get away with anything. Um, and the risks if we do violate our our ethical conduct is getting shut down, getting astronomical fines. Um, losing employment. And certainly I know I always tell people, I don't lose my license. So, you know, I can't work without my license. And so um, these are real um, barriers that prevent people from kind of taking advantage like they have in the past. And um, also the thing that I like with this trial that kind of gave me comfort as a African-American woman is that the diversity of the trial. A lot of times I know that um, they really hardly did anything to recruit black and brown uh, folks into clinical trials. You know, that, oh, they're hard to reach. And so they didn't really put too much effort in trying to make sure that we were included in those vaccine trials, that we were represented, that it worked the same way for us that it does for everyone else. And so I was really, really just um, happy to see those numbers and that inclusion um, for African-Americans was prioritized. So as far as misinformation, I think one of the, the, the big ones um, is that you know, you're going to have some huge and negative reaction or it's gonna come at some random time. You know, and I think understanding that this technology is not new, um, Dr. Jam can talk to the science of that, that 
you know, where this is built from. Um, but that also, um, you see that little white sliver in there. Those are the portion of people who had uh, a reaction to the vaccine. So it's very, very minuscule, very, very small. Um, and it's less than less than 1%, so 0.001%. Um, and that means that we know that um, many, many people, millions and millions of people have taken these vaccines. Uh, I think more than 78% of the US population is vaccinated at this point. Is that correct, Dr. Jam? Yeah, 78%. Um, and so we, we have evidence that this is something that is, you know, uh, people are not having these huge adverse reactions. Um, and so we can be comforted to know that we're getting protection for our health. Um, but all this is normal. You know, we, we fear is normal. It's new, it's unknown. We may have questions and hopefully we can ask some of those questions today. And it's really just helpful to avoid all those shortcuts, you know, what's easy, what's convenient, you know, we like a little sound bite sometimes, you know, um, you know, or if it doesn't fit, we must have quit, right? And that's not the same as, as COVID, but just those little sound bites that we sometimes latch onto because they sound good. But what is the, the real meaning behind our beliefs, right? What is the reality in the data? How, what are the concerns for our family, for our elderly relatives, for our people who can't get vaccinated? Um, you know, we can do our part to make sure that we are not only taking care of ourselves, but as a collectivist community, making sure that we're taking care of other people as well. Uh, so just to kind of, um, you know, talk a little bit about the booster. I know for some people, they were a little shocked, like they didn't tell us we had to get a booster. Uh, and hopefully that has gone away a little bit now that boosters have become more, um, more common. Um, a lot of people are signing up to get boosters. One thing I know for me that was informative that just kind of helped me understand the booster was that uh, it's a lower dose. So I know some of the side effects that are normal with vaccines. Um, I know for myself, I had fewer side effects with the lower dose. Um, we know globally, so then again, we're talking about beyond the United States that um, billions of people have been vaccinated. Uh, and you know, so we have a lot of evidence of how these vaccines work, what's happening with them, the, the risks and the, you know, the benefits. Um, and we have to kind of weigh all that and continue to make sure that we have the, the, the best tools to fight against this disease and fight against infection, fight against hospitalizations and death. Um, it's really kind of important to keep up with um, your health in, in this regard. Prevention is the best, the best cure. Um, so what we have seen also is that there have been new fears that, that come with that, some vaccine fears around uh, for the children. And I just encourage people to really, again, talk to your pediatrician about your concerns, talk to your children. I know um, the last one, I think in December, I actually brought my daughter and talked to her, had her talk a little bit about her experience with the COVID vaccine um, and you know, think about the benefits for them as well. Um, I know we want to make good decisions for our kids. We love our children. We want to make sure that they're healthy as well. Um, and we want to make informed decisions. We don't want to make decisions based on fear. And so making sure that you're having those conversations, asking questions, um, and doing it multiple times. You know, sometimes this is not a one-time thing. We have to talk to each other, you know, more than once. You know, I, I can think of somebody I, I, I think I talked to probably six or seven times. I'm not getting the vaccine, Dr. Yeah, I'm not, nope, 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 nope. And I'm just like, oh, did you know this new information? Did you know that new information? The next time I saw the person after seven conversations, I, I went and got my first dose. And I was so <laughs> excited. I was so excited. Now I could have been impatient. I could have been irritable. I could have been annoyed that I had to keep having the same conversation over, over and over again. But just sitting and listening with empathy, listening to people's fears, you know, making sure that there was a safe space for her to ask questions and to, to explore in a non-defensive way was just, a, it, at some point it just clicked for her. Um, and I was just so excited to see the effect of these conversations. And so that's really why we're here tonight. These forums are really helpful. You know, we are coming from a, a faith-based approach. You know, we talk about faith, fear, facts. There doesn't have to be a separation between faith and science. Um, I feel like God has blessed us with uh, these beautiful brains that have been able to put together these wonderful and amazing things to help his healing ministry. Um, you're not alone in your fears. I mean, you know, we have, we hear this all the time and we continue to have these conversations, um, but it's bigger than us. We have to really think about other people and, and, and not just ourselves. Cause some people say, well, it, it, I'm not at risk, but you have to think about <laughs> then you passing it to other people who may not be able to defend themselves with vaccines. 
um, just be open. I did ask you tonight, especially to be open to my colleague, Dr. Jam, um, with the information that she has to present, gather that information, ask your questions, and then weigh the evidence. You know, I, I remind people that um, neither Dr. Jam or I are here to tell you what to do. You all are fully capable adults. We just want to present you with the best information, the most up-to-date information as possible so that you can make informed decisions about your health. So with that, um, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. And that's from Nelson Mandela. So thank you for your time. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Bishop Simmons. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Petit. Uh, Sister King, I don't know if you see any questions in the chat for Dr. Petit, but if anyone has uh, any questions, we have time to take one, maybe two. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I actually have a question um, with my family and I actually having contracted COVID during Christmas time and then recently receiving our boosters. So um, one of the questions that I receive a lot from individuals in the community are like, what are the chances if you've had COVID and you've gotten boosted, the chance for you um, to be exposed and get it again, whether it's mild or severe, um, as well as possibly needing another booster dose. So I'll let Dr. Jim answer more fully, but I know one of my favorite things, I was also somebody boosted and they got COVID. Um, it was very mild just for a day or so. Um, but one of my things that I was very excited about was kind of the idea of having double immunity. Like I felt like I had the booster and the antibodies and I was just feeling like, I think, confident going out in the world in a way that I had not felt in the last two years. Uh, and so for me, I, I, I kind of took it in that vein. Like, I am glad that no one got severely sick, that it was short, that, you know, no one required hospitalization. Um, but I don't know the particular rates. Maybe, um, Dr. Jim, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Right. So um, at this point, of course, it's our, um, through the loose data that we have, those people that those people that are boosted do um, develop COVID at a lesser rate than those that are unvaccinated or that have only received two doses. However, I do want to be transparent about the fact that you can, and as Dr. Petit said, get COVID while being boosted. So because you've had it before, um, just because you all are boosted doesn't mean that you necessarily won't get COVID. But if you were to get COVID, then like Dr. Petit said, it is something that would be like a light cold. Um, very much like the normal, a normal common cold, which is essentially what we want to get with COVID. We want it to be like not as big of a deal if someone were to get it. We don't want to play that game of chance of whether they'll live with, you know, having had COVID or not. We want them to be okay if they um, if they were to contract it. So that's what that's our hope with the booster. The more antibodies you have, the more that your body is used to COVID. Essentially, the less damage it will do to your body should you become infected with it. So that's our hope. That's the way, you know, immunity is supposed to work. And that's what we are seeing it to be true when people do develop COVID-19 after having been boosted, even with getting two doses. Um, I know Sister King, your entire family at least had received like the first, the two dose series of the mRNA vaccines. And while, you know, COVID was detrimental for everybody to have it in the household, what you can say is that nobody ended up in the hospital, nobody ended up on the ventilator and June Junior himself, you know, has seizures, and you all can say that Junior was okay. So were, you know, Renee and Kiana. So I think that is definitely the um, the highlight in being vaccinated. I think that's the success right there in seeing what it is that the vaccines can do for you and your family. But yeah, so it's our hope that the more protection you have, the more the um, less of the less impact that COVID will have. Will we have to get additional doses? We don't know. And I'm not at the liberty to make that assumption and I don't want to, you know, for you all. I think that is, but I do think that it's not wrong to think of COVID as something that'll be like a yearly vaccination. And we hope to get that, we hope to get to that point where it's like, okay, every year you just, you have to get a COVID vaccine. So uh, just like the flu. Thank you. Uh Dr. Jam for that. Uh, I had two things and it's gonna help us pivot right into your section. So, you know, stay, stay close. Uh, yep. uh, doc, Dr. Petit, uh, you, you talked about fear and how fear is common. And, and I was having a conversation this week, how we are so fearful of what we don't know. And uh, 
in in your profession and and in mine's also we have to major in how to get people past their fear we call it just moving by faith but i'm sure in, in, in your arena there's a different uh way to phrase that what it will be your best um uh, advice on moving people past their fear to get to something that will benefit them? Yeah, I think the first part is that, I think what I, one of the things I already said is that fear is normal, that, you know, it's normal to, you know, um, have questions and concerns about things that you don't know about. Um, so that's a, a kind of normal idea. So sometimes people will think that, oh, you're saying that there's something wrong with them for having fear, and that couldn't be further from the truth. I think second, the thing that we know about fear is a lot of times it's about, it, we, we say anxiety is worrying about the future versus worrying about what's happening right now. So what could be, what might be, what, you know, versus right now, what, the things that we know, the things that we know that we're dying at higher rates from COVID infections. Um, versus some question mark that is usually something that we're probably creating in our minds and making bigger than it is. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it, just kind of pulling yourself back from that. Like, what are the things that I know that I can touch? What are the facts that are here in front of me right now? Not what could be, what conspiracy, what, you know, what things are, you know, down the road um, that I don't know that could happen. Focus on the here and now. Um, what are the things you can do to protect yourself right now um, and not worrying about those question marks um, that are, again, usually magnified and they feel bigger because they're unknown. But in reality, we have to really look at uh, actual data, actual <laughs> knowledge that we know that we can we can see that has already been collected, has already been published, has already been examined um, and not kind of um, feed into those conspiracies. Um, that about what could happen. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Petit, for that answer. And thank you for uh, once again sharing your gifts with us and helping us uh, in this fight against COVID and preparing us uh, in every facet of our lives, our, our mental and our emotional and our decision making process. So thank you once again. And then my second thing is, and this we can officially uh, once again bring in Dr. Jam, it's just a quick. Uh, testimony. Um, as all of you know who are on here, uh, Sister King and Dr. Jam and Dr. Petit, you were there when I brought my family over to get boosted uh, at one of the events that was hosted by COPE. And we did. And when we, we took our daughter back to school in Nashville, and we woke up one Saturday morning, and my wife and I, we weren't feeling too well. And at our uh, congregation, Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, along with COPE and ICAC churches, we've been passing out the self-test kits. And so we, my wife and I tested in it on a Saturday morning and it said we were positive. Or we like the, we just almost had a flip right there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a, a sore throat and our and runny nose. And so our daughter, as most of you know, uh, is a lupus warrior. So we were just like, no. So we got her to her room and we uh, had her isolated. She tested negative. And she never did test positive, but that was on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we tested again and we were negative. That was the extent of our encounter with the Omicron. And we truly believe God had his hand on us, but we also were fully vaccinated and boosted. And so we encourage people, uh, uh, Dr. Petit, if they have, um, any apprehensions, and you don't want to go with the science, there's nothing wrong with a good old testimony. Amen. <laughs> so that being said, we want to turn uh, the rest, the next time to Dr. Jam, who will give us the science. Dr. Jam. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here on these vaccine calls. So I'm going to go through my presentation. And honestly, you all can probably give it better than me at this point. But um, I'm super excited to be here. But I do want to take this time to, um, you know, to really thank Sister King and, and Bishop Simmons and Pastor Casey, because it's through you all's testimonies that we are able to continue to be successful. It's through you all's testimonies that we're able to 
Um, because I mean, you know, Dr. Petit and I, we have the best intentions, but I think that at the end of the day, you all are who the community knows and to have you all um, as our co-signers or being able to attest to what it is that the vaccines have been for you and for your families and the protection that they've afforded to you and your families during this really, this really, really challenging time is just, um, it's amazing. It's honestly humbling, you know, but it's also, um, I'm so happy to be a part of this outreach and to be able to um, engage in this work with you all. And I essentially hope that we can make this more than just focusing on COVID-19. We want to really emphasize the importance of all vaccinations. When we think about the Black community, we think about disease states that affect us. We think about, you know, we think about something like the flu. We say, oh, we want COVID to be the flu. Well, guess what? Black people are more likely to die from influenza or from the flu than any other racial or ethnic group. Like when we think about um, bacterial pneumonia, Black people are more likely to die from bacterial pneumonia than any other group. But there are vaccines that could prevent people from dying from this. There are vaccines that could give you protection and antibodies against these diseases. So we want to take it, we want to do everything that we can and start to think about how can we take this a step further than um, just talking about COVID. COVID is important, but we want you all to be protected against everything. So let's open our minds to that as we continue to move forward throughout time. So um, you all know my name, you know the title, you guys know what this party looks like. So um, once again, with live vaccines, we know that live vaccines are that small, alive piece of the virus that's injected into you, then your body makes protection or immunity against it. We know that we have different types of live vaccines, so measles, mumps, rubella. We can have some flu vaccines that are live. And they'll tell you if you're pregnant, don't get this live vaccine because it may move across and affect the baby. So we know there are vaccines that work in that way. And then we have our inactivated vaccines. Our inactivated vaccines have gone through fire and chemicals. They've been degraded a bit, but that means that with these vaccines, um, it still maintains a bit of integrity so your body can make protection uh, should you ever see these things in real life. But then we also know because they were inactivated, not as powerful as the live vaccines, that you're going to need a little boost or something to remind your body that you've seen protection against it. So now we know we have our mRNA vaccines or we have our COVID vaccines, so mRNA and adenovirus vector. So with our mRNA vaccines, what it does is it um, tells your body to make a specific protein that you would need to survive. In this case, it tells your body, hey, make this spike protein. Once your body makes this spike protein, it sees it and it says, hey, this isn't supposed to be here. Let me make some protection against this. So then once your body makes protection against it, should you see COVID-19 in real life, then you should be protected against it. And then we have our adenovirus vector vaccine. Um, if you were to receive J&J, &J, now it is recommended that you receive the mRNA vaccines over Johnson & Johnson. I know at Loma Linda, we don't even carry the Johnson & Johnson vaccine any longer. So we want to urge you all to receive the mRNA vaccines as we start to progress into this more um, infectious time of COVID. We want something that will provide the maximum amount of protection. But with these, with these types of vaccines, um, they work in a similar way with the mRNA vaccines, meaning they still carry um, that, that mRNA information so your body can make that protection against it should it see it in real, should it, when it sees it, so should you see COVID-19 in real life, you should be protected. So when we think about the coronavirus, uh, we think about different variants that we hear. So as Bishop talked about his battle with the Omicron variant. So we know that um, coronavirus can change itself a little bit. So that's why we, we're continuing to see it after 2020. It morphs, it changes, it tries to find a way to sustain itself so it can continue to live. So our bodies prepare for this because viruses do this all the time. It says, hey, I'm not gonna make just one type of protection against this virus. I'm gonna make sure I make a lot of different types of protection show, so that if one area Area gets knocked out, or if it changes itself a little bit, I can still recognize it and I can still go ahead and protect myself against it. So we have our T cells that run out first to protect us, and then we have our antibodies or our memory cells. So then we, let's think about this from the Omicron standpoint. So we know the Omicron variant, it was a bit different than the original strain of coronavirus. So it knocked out an area or maybe it knocked out some of the antibodies. But because our bodies 
prepare for that difference in how the COVID-19 may look, we were able to bring out other antibodies or other streams of protection to protect us from COVID-19. So let's put this into perspective of Sister King. So she said, hey, you know, I got COVID-19, but I was vaccinated. So, you know, I we were only infectious or we only we were only out for um, about a week. So they had received two doses of the vaccine. So as to where um, Dr. Petit had received a booster, so when she got COVID, she had maybe 100,000 streams of protection because she had the maximum amount of antibodies. Sister King had maybe about 50,000 cells of protection, but guess what? They both had enough cells of protection despite, the, despite one of them having two doses and the other having three doses, they both had um, protection to go ahead and not end up in the hospital, not end up dying from COVID-19. But I do want to hone in on the importance of the booster. Let's look at the amount of days that they were out. So Dr. Petit told us, hey, well, I got the booster dose. I was only out for about three days. Sister King told us that she got, her and her family were infected and they were about, out for about seven, seven days, seven to 10 days or so. So that's the difference between having the maximum amount of protection and then not having the maximum amount of protection, but both of which are protected enough that they didn't end up in the hospital or um, passing away due to COVID-19. Thank God for that. So then when we think through these clinical studies, I won't spend time going on the number of participants and all of that information because most of you all have been here before and are aware of what I do and what I, what I talk about in terms of that. I will just say that Black individuals, Latino, Latinx, Native Americans, and older individuals were adequately represented in these in um, these clinical trials, and they wanted to make sure these individuals were represented so that in the event that um, questions arose regarding COVID, they knew that indeedingly these individuals that were being major majorly affected by the virus were protected. So when we think about um, those individuals after they received that second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, we think about those folks that developed COVID versus those that did not. We had eight individuals in that vaccine group that developed COVID versus 162 in that group that was not vaccinated. So we see about that 95% of effectiveness or what what we what you also say is these people were about twenty times twenty times more likely to be protected should they been back should they have been vaccinated so that's what the vaccine can do with the Pfizer vaccine they saw that two doses were required at this time to provide the um to provide adequate protection now we know you need three doses to provide the super super adequate to make sure that you are absolutely covered. Um, against COVID in terms of the um, detrimental effects that it can have. So while we see that 95% and we know 20 times more likely to be protected is good, still not 100%. So you can still develop COVID, right? We just don't want it to put you in the hospital. We don't want it to be severe. And this, and this study showed that it was only one case that was severe and that person did not pass away from COVID-19. So we talk about adverse events. We know you can have a headache, injection site tenderness, low grade fever, and then we think about the COVID vaccine in children. So as we move into this, this new phase of COVID and we hear Governor Newsom, he's saying now, you know, the vaccine mandate indoors is going to be optional for those individuals that um, are uh, vaccinated and then they are not going to require the masks to be worn in schools. This is a concern for me. One, because individuals of the Black community are still majorly affected by COVID-19. As of right now, Black individuals are the most affected by COVID-19 in Southern California. In Southern California, Black individuals are dying at the highest rates. Not only are Black adults dying at the highest rates, but Black children are dying at the highest rates. They are the second most likely children, second most likely race of children to pass away from COVID-19. So um, Pfizer recruited children into their studies. So we know that the 12 to 15 year olds were the first children that were included. And in the vaccine group, um, there were um, about 1,000 individuals versus 978 that did not receive the vaccine. There were 16 cases of COVID-19 that developed in this clinical trial. And of those 16 cases, they were all in that placebo group, meaning that it is effective in that 12 to 15 age group. So with the with the um, with the 
COVID-19 study when they went to try the vaccine in children that were five to 11 years old, they wanted, they had to do a dose finding study because you have to go ahead and find which dose is going to be the most effective and the most protective and produce the less, the least amount of side effects. So what they did is they compared the 30 microgram dose, which is the dose that adults receive. And well, those individuals that are 12 and up receive the 30 microgram dose. So adults and then adolescents. So they compared that dose to a dose of 10 micrograms and then 20 micrograms. So they said, what's the lowest that we can go to still get the maximum effect but have the, the least amount of side effects? So with that being said, they found that that 10 microgram dose was comparative to that 30 microgram dose that adults receive. So they said, okay, for those five to 11 years old, we'll give them the 10 microgram dose because we can get the same amount of protection, but then we have a lesser amount of side effects. So that's what they did there to go ahead and figure that out. And then when they went ahead and try and, and try out the vaccine, so meaning they vaccinated children and compared those that were vaccinated versus those that were unvaccinated, they saw 90.7% efficacy. So three children in that vaccine group developed COVID-19 versus 16 in the placebo. So still a good amount of protection against developing COVID, but then no deaths or hospitals, hospitalizations due to COVID in those children, very important. And then we think about injection site pain and then fatigue and headache, then uh, we can say that those children um, experience that as a, at a lesser frequency, especially when compared to adults. So then we also want to think about why is it so important that we get our kids vaccinated? Of course, as I said, with that study, we're seeing COVID-19 at lesser rates, right? Well, it's important because as I told you all, there can be other there can be other collateral effects or other things that can happen. And that being the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that we are seeing in children, but individuals that, but kids that are black and um, Hispanic are experienced or being diagnosed with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome more than those children, more than uh, white children. So they are experiencing this the most, despite representing significantly less of the United States population. So this is the reason we want to vaccinate our kids. We want to make sure that they are protected against um, not only COVID, but the things that COVID can cause. And then we think of the, about the Moderna trial. The Moderna trial is quite similar in terms of the makeup of enrollees or people that participated in the study. Like I said, with the mRNA vaccines, it's best for you to receive. Or at the, at the start of this, it was best for individuals to receive two doses. And now we know for the, for the maximum, maximum amount of protection, we want to do that booster dose. And then when they, when they did the first rollout of this study, they saw that 11 individuals in that vaccine group developed COVID-19 versus 185 that was not in the vaccine group. So we can clearly see that um, being vaccinated puts you in a much better position. And then when we look at the number of severe COVID-19 cases, there were 30 cases in the study. However, there were none in that vaccination group. Very, very important. And then we think about adverse events, headache, injection site tenderness, low-grade fever, all of which that are very short-lasting in nature. So I really want to spend some time and talk about COVID-19 vaccine and pregnancy. I'm not pregnant myself, so I always offer this um, recommendation. I always provide just this insight from an, un an unpregnant standpoint, from the standpoint of a woman that does not have children, but as one that has seen uh, pregnant women that end up in the hospital and that are ending up in the hospital at far greater rates due to COVID-19 and hearing about the children that are uh, being delivered from COVID-19 mothers and be them being underweight and really um, severely compromised due to their mother having COVID-19, it's important that we talk about the vaccines. We talk about um, how the CDC and the FDA approve of it, pregnant women receiving these vaccinations. And it's just very important that we all just give um, consideration to this when you are making that decision whether to be vaccinated or not if you are a pregnant woman or, or considering being considering getting pregnant or a breastfeeding woman. So in the Moderna study, there were women enrolled that did not know that they were pregnant and there were 13 pregnant participants. Six of the participants had received the vaccine, seven did not receive the vaccine and all of the poor pregnancy related events that they saw were in those individuals that had not been vaccinated. So what that means is that they did not see the, vac the vaccine contribute to anything there. There have been over 400,000 pregnant women 
that have been vaccinated against COVID and there have not been any alarming um, reports in terms of fetal or maternal health. So that's another thing that we think about also with the mRNA technology um, that is used. The, the mRNA readily leaves our bodies. It was gone in about 24 to 48 hours, so it in no way crosses the placenta, once again, making it so that pregnant women are safe. And then studies were done in the, by Moderna to see how their vaccines performed in pregnant rats, which is important because rats do share a similar biochemistry to humans, and they did not see any pregnancy-related <clears throat> excuse me, adverse events. So that, again, places us in that situation when we think about what it is that being um, vaccinated in pregnancy can look like and how it can be protective again, for the pregnant woman as well as their baby. So when we think about booster doses versus third doses, so um, due to COVID-19, due to the variants, it is a recommendation that we go ahead and boost. So with um, those individuals that are not immunocompromised, a third dose is considered a booster dose. So it's to boost, it's exactly what it does. It boosts the amount of antibodies or the amount of protection that you have against COVID-19. It tries to account for any differences that may exist in the strains, right? So when the, so when you see those variants, it tries to account for whatever area it can knock out. It gives you more antibodies, more protection so you can feel those empty spots. But for those people that are immunocompromised, now that third dose has become a part of your usual dosing series, but you still need a booster dose. So say that you're someone that has cancer and you, so is it, so now what that looks like is you receive dose one, 21 days later, if you're getting Pfizer, you get dose two, 21 days later, you get dose three, and then five months after that, you get a booster dose. That's the recommendation now. So if you are immunocompromised, then that means that you get dose one, dose two, dose three, dose four. So um, if, if there are any questions about that, go ahead and put them in the chat. So um, in terms of the dosings for uh, Pfizer and Moderna, for a booster dose of the Pfizer vaccine, that dose is the same amount that you received for the first two doses if you are not immunocompromised, same that you would have received for the first three if you are immunocompromised. For a Moderna vaccine, a booster dose is half of the dose that is given in the initial two dose series. So that means that if you um, are not immunocompromised and you receive two doses of Moderna. So that's 0.5. If you go for a booster dose, then you get 0.25. So a booster dose has been recommended for the following recommendations. At this point, it's for five, excuse, excuse the um, language here. It is five months for anybody that's been vaccinated at this point that we're in right now. And then if you got J&J, &J, it is two months after you receive the J&J &J vaccine. And it's the recommendation that you receive an mRNA vaccine. So I do want to make sure that I tell everyone it is okay to mix and match, meaning that you can, if you receive Moderna for your first two doses, you can receive Pfizer. If you receive, if you are in that place where you're receiving your first two doses, well, you can go Pfizer and then you can go Moderna. And then for your booster, you can do Moderna or Pfizer again. It is your decision. If you receive J&J, &J, then that means that you only have to receive one mRNA vaccine, one dose of an mRNA vaccine for a booster. So I just want to make sure that everyone is clear about what that looks like. So in terms of herd immunity, what these vaccines are going to do, no matter which one you receive, is going to get us closer to herd immunity. But more importantly, it is going to get the Black community, the Black community, Latino, Latinx, Native American communities, closer to being protected against COVID-19. I, I want to be clear and say, you know, don't get it twisted. We see that the we see that different restrictions are lowering. Black communities, Native American, Latino, Latinx communities are continuing to be affected. And we can see who it is that's being left behind as attitudes surrounding COVID-19 begin to change. Don't forget what this looks like for our community. Don't forget how important people receiving this information and hearing this testimo these testimonies from you all is. We don't want for folks to have to get COVID-19 to pass the immunity. We don't know if people will survive. We want people to be able to be vaccinated and then go ahead and, and deliver immunity through that mechanism. So I wanna round out by saying flu season is here. And um, even if, Flu season is wrapping up here in California, but even if you didn't get your flu vaccine this year, 
Let's consider it for next year. Let's think about what vaccines can do, what vaccines can prevent. Consider the fact that Black individuals of racially and ethnically minoritized groups die more often than anyone else from flu. So this is completely preventable. These deaths are preventable. We can do that through vaccination. So we want to make sure that we're keeping the importance of vaccines at the forefront, at the forefront of our minds. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this share so that anyone can ask questions if they have them. Thank Dr. you. Jam. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Jam. Go ahead, Sister King. Um, I apologize, Bishop. Um, I did receive a question. It's regarding first doses. So mm -hmm. if someone received their first dose on April 10th, um, are they eligible to receive their second dose of that vaccine by the 24th? By uh, the 24th of of April, April. if they receive the first dose on April. Right. 10th. So you can do um, so three weeks afterwards is typically so like 21 days so i guess april 24th will be a little bit too soon so we'll have to adjust but um three weeks after uh you receive the uh first dose if you if you get pfizer if you get moderna then it's a month afterwards however it is the recommendation uh for school aged young men to wait six weeks after receiving the mrna vaccines to receive the second dose so if you are a school-aged young man and you are um, receiving the vaccine, then you have to wait six weeks. However, when you go to be vaccinated, then they will let you know um, the duration that you have to wait. Remember on the backs of the cards, I would put when you all would have to return to uh, for a dose two to receive your second dose of the vaccine, then um, they will do that. But if you are, if you fall within that age group, and that's because of the, um, myocarditis cases that we're seeing. So that means like the inflammation of the heart that was seen in that age group. They wanna make sure that um, those, those young, it was more, more often seen in young men, but they wanna make sure that they have time to develop immunity and, um, or to, to have the immune response happen in a way that it naturally does, but not put them at the increased risk of a um, power punch immune response that could result in just that um, inflammation that we were seeing. Thank you so Hopefully much. Hopefully that's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Sister King, for that. And thank you, Dr. Jam. Dr. Jam, uh, every time you come, you, you this may seem like it's old hat to you, but you drop a couple of nuggets that we have to revisit. One, I appreciate your emphasis on that um, in the Black community. Uh, and you emphasize in Southern California, and that's where we are, <laughs> that... Um, more uh, people are getting sick and dying still from COVID. And you mentioned children also, but I just want you to touch on a little bit about the, um, the effects of COVID or the after effects of COVID and the multi-system inflama inflammatory, inflammatory, there we go, system. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, the after effects of COVID can be, I mean, I think that it's so many people in the church that tell me what happened to them after they got COVID. They, they say, Dr. Jam, I wasn't vaccinated. I got COVID. I still can't breathe, you know, like the correct way, or I still have trouble breathing. You know, I'm still coughing up phlegm or it's still things wrong with me and they can't figure out what it is six months later. So I think that, you know, so many people in the community can tell you about what it is that developing COVID and not being vaccinated has resulted in. But when we think about multi-inflammatory syndrome, so it's just something that can happen. When you, when you are infected with COVID-19, your body has a severe immune response. It just kicks into high gear because it sees this virus and then it sets off your, your inflammation responses. When your body, your body becomes inflamed when it wants to get something that's not supposed to be there out of the way. So when your body sees COVID, COVID is like that red alert. It's like, oh my goodness, I have to get this out of the way, but COVID doesn't leave. So your body is just consistently in this place of like inflammation. So in kids, in kids and adult, we can see like the multi-inflammatory syndrome. So that means that a lot of different systems or a lot of different areas in your body become very inflamed at once, but we see it more so in kids. But we're seeing it a lot in Black and Native and Black and Latino kids. 
And that's because let's think about racism. Let's think about different structures and different systems that are in place. Well, you know, a lot of times individuals in the black community are more likely to work in, in essential jobs, meaning like in grocery in, in grocery stores, in hospital cleaning services, um, as bus drivers in, in these different areas, meaning they have to go to work. They're, con they're constantly in contact with COVID-19. Well, when they go home, individuals of the black community, Native, Native American, Latino, Latinx, are more often to live in multi-generational households, but then also in households where you don't have the opportunity to go and confine yourself you know, in another room so you don't infect your kids or anyone else there. And we're in, also we're in that place where because we work in this way, the kids um, have to go to school. So who knows, you know, who, you, you don't know what the kids are bringing to school with them. You know, God forbid, everybody always says kids always bring so much stuff back home with them because they're around, you know, like any and everybody else. So I think that, you know, really thinking about vaccinating our kids, having this necessary information is so important because that is going to be our key to really combating COVID-19. But we don't even think about because at one point they didn't stress, you know, like COVID-19 in kids. We weren't seeing as many cases. But as the virus evolves, we are seeing cases. And we know that at the end of the day, the cases in Black and brown kids are going to be disproportional. They just are. That's just the, that's the way that the cards are stacked against us. So I think Dr. Petit, she, she said a really good thing. She said our way to get out ahead of this is for preventive measures, is for vaccinations. And that's our way ahead. Thank you so much for that, for that answer. If there's anyone who's on with us that have a question for Dr. Jam and, and or Dr. Petit, you, you can do so right now. You see how dynamic you are. You, you answered all the questions <laughs> already. That's uh, because ahead. Phil's not on today. Okay. <laughs> and I actually have um, an additional question regarding the side effects, loss mm -hmm. of um, taste and smell. That was one of the side effects that I experienced and it kind of comes in. Right. Um, is there kind of like a time frame in which, you know, this will go on or will it subside? Well, the hope is that it does. And you, there are a ton of like studies ongoing that are trying to look at the symptoms of long COVID, but it's so hard because it's so subjective and it varies from person to person. So it's really hard to collect all of those and follow like how long it is that they last. I know for a friend of mine, she had COVID and she said that she had ridiculous memory loss. And she said it was like something that persisted for like six months or so. So it's my hope, Sister King, that you're able to get your sense of like smell, smell and taste, but like that it doesn't, you know, go in and out on you. I know that probably has to be the worst experience. But um, unfortunately, we don't have a clear answer on how long it is that it lasts. I hope that it quickly subsides <laughs> for you. Thank in you. Our, yes, so do I. <laughs> in our chat, we have, uh, you can see that it's been posted, uh, the latest COVID-19 press uh, release from uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, so we can have the update of, of his recommendations. Also, I, I just wanted to share that, you know, we hear all, we got all the statistics and the bad stories from 2020 of the effects of COVID, how it impacted families and the death that was caused. And I, I would uh, like to challenge someone to make some money, maybe it should be me, to uh, produce documents and um, video documentation of the success stories of people who did get vaccinated, fully vaccinated, boosted, and they may have contracted COVID, but it it was they didn't have to go to the hospital. Uh, they didn't have a a terrible end to family members because we know the science is there. But a lot of time, people want to see, hey, how did it impact you? Did you get vaccinated? What happened when you? I believe that that. Uh, that will be beneficial. And to that point, here's my last thing, and then we'll get into our wrap up. Uh, at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, where we serve, uh, we have been blessed. Three young mothers had children, uh, like in successive months, and all the children are healthy and the parents are healthy. Uh, 
for one that I know for sure, I'm not sure about the other two, but one that I know for sure had questions about being vaccinated, but she was vaccinated either right before she became pregnant or right after it. And her baby was born without any issues, beautiful young girl, mother is fine. So that uh, when you uh, shared the information regarding pregnant mothers, uh, we do have a testimony, maybe more than one, that it did not uh, infect them in a negative way. So Dr. Jem, do you have a final comment? Like I said, and I think I maybe gave my final comment too early, but it is just such an honor and a pleasure to work with you all. Um, I hope that this has been helpful and I hope that we see you all at the vaccine clinic on Sunday. Those folks that need to get their first dose, second dose, booster doses, please, please, please come out to the vaccine clinic on Sunday. Tell a friend to tell a friend. I also have a link of this exact information that I provided to you all this evening. I can um, send that link to uh, Sister King so we can um, get it. We can make sure that it's disseminated out or um, Reverend Dr. Woods also has it if anyone from the church is present and uh, needs that link to the, to the video. But it is my hope that um, you all are um, in a better place and are considering the information and will get vaccinated against COVID. We're in this together. That's all for me. Thank you so much. Sister King. Thank you, Dr. Jam and Bishop. And as Dr. Jam did mention, we are having a vaccination clinic this Sunday, March 6th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, it will be at Life Change Ministries Church in San Bernardino. Um, first, second, and booster shots. I did post the link in the chat if you would like to still register, or if you know of someone, as she said, please, please, please share out this information um, because together we get better. Thank you so much. Uh... Sister King, again, we wanna thank, thank our partners at Loma Linda University Health, Dr. Bridget Petit, thank you so much uh, for your contribution. Dr. Jam, thank you so much for being Dr. Jam and being with us tonight. Uh, Sister King, thank you for your leadership in this evening's a town hall meeting and COPE, we appreciate your efforts and we thank everyone from the Inland Empire Concerned African American Churches. Dr. Jam closed her remarks by saying, we are all in this together. I cover you, you cover me, and I think we'll be all right. But if I was to, for whatever reason, didn't think about you before I think about me, I don't think we, you will be covered and I wouldn't be covered either. So let's be conscious of our family members and our neighbors. Uh, that's my closing remarks. We're going to have, I'll, I'll do the closing prayer and we will be done for this evening. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gifts that you've given us in your people. We thank you, Lord, for uh, COPE and for ICAC, for Loma Linda University, Dr. Dr. Bridget Petit and Dr. Jam and everyone that they uh, collaborate with at the university. Father, we pray that you bless them for their efforts looking out for your people. Now, everyone that's on the Zoom tonight, God, we ask that you bless them and their families. God, give us not only the wisdom, but the courage to cover one another, cover our neighbors as well as ourselves, so that we will be better, better for ourselves, better for our families, and better for our communities. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. Be safe.